So today we're going to talk a little bit about POTS, Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome, a condition that's very close to my heart and something that I have actually personally lived with for the last six years or so. It's a very debilitating condition and today I'm going to discuss some ideas that you will not have heard most likely across the entirety of YouTube of people talking about what some of the origins of the condition actually are, so make sure you stay tuned. So let's kick off with what is POTS? Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome is an abnormal increase in heart rate that occurs after sitting up or standing. And some typical symptoms include dizziness and fainting. And one key way this is identified is the practitioner will have the patient lie down on a tilt table and then they'll gradually tilt the patient up to a standing position. And if there's a change in heart rate of 30 beats or more per minute, from lying to standing, then POTS is typically diagnosed. Now there's a handful of symptoms typically associated with POTS. I'm just gonna go over these very quickly. Dizziness, lightheadedness, fainting, palpitations, anxiety, gut dysfunction, typically gastroparesis slash slow bowel motility, headaches, brain fog, fatigue, insomnia, blood pooling. There's also plenty more to mention as well, guys. I'm not going to get into them in this video but there's just such an array of symptoms that pot sufferers typically end up suffering with. Now, just before I get into what I believe a couple of the reasons are behind the origins of POTS emerging in people, I wanna break down the meaning of the term itself. So if I were to break down postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome into a sentence, it would get something along the lines of a heart rate that increases by an abnormal amount only in response to an orthostatic challenge. And this is a really important point to note because it would imply that the individual's heart rate is only raising an abnormal amount in response to gravity itself. It's not that that individual has an abnormally high resting heart rate. It's just that when they are challenged with orthostasis, so when they stand upright and their body has to deal with the stress of gravity, that's when the abnormal heart rate tends to kick in. And here's some vital information when it comes to learning about heart rate and blood pressure. So our blood pressure should remain the same when transitioning from a supine to a standing position. So that means from a lying to a standing position or ever so slightly rise. Now when going from supine to standing, heart rate should rise by between five to 10 beats per minute once the position is established. Now mechanisms should kick in that drop the heart rate by a few beats per minute. So we shouldn't be having these drastic spikes of our heart rate. What we should really be having is a gradual rise in heart rate to help to maintain blood pressure, to allow blood to actually rush up to our head to prevent dizziness and fainting and lightheadedness. And then the mechanism should kick in that actually lower the heart rate by a few beats. And another thing to note here is that resting heart rate is highly dependent upon each individual's physiology. Both structural and functional variables can create either a higher or lower resting heart rate. And we see this when it comes to either somebody being sedentary versus somebody who is a trained athlete. That trained athlete will tend to have a low resting heart rate whereas the sedentary individual will tend to have a high resting heart rate. So now moving on to intelligent mechanics. So have you ever considered the complexity of the human circulatory system? Think about the position of the brain in relation to our heart. We are one of only a few species out there in which our body must deal with the pressures of gravity in order to deliver sufficient amounts of blood and oxygen up to our brain. And this is a super important point to note because while pretty much every single human out there is taking this mechanism for granted, if it becomes dysfunctional, the human body is really going to struggle to deliver sufficient blood and oxygen to the head efficiently when changing from that lying to standing position. And it's these mechanisms we really need to delve more closely into when it comes to addressing a condition like POTS because it's all about that change between a lying and standing position and trying to get adequate blood flow up to the head in time to prevent symptoms like fainting and dizziness and lightheadedness. Which brings me very nicely onto the role of the baro reflex. So the baro reflex provides a rapid negative feedback loop in which an elevated blood pressure causes heart rate to decrease 
and a decreased blood pressure causes the heart rate to rise in order to restore blood pressure levels. And if we think about this logically, this makes total sense because if our blood pressure levels are rising and there's excess vasoconstriction in the blood vessels, then we want the heart rate to slow down to allow vasodilation to occur. But if vasodilation is occurring and blood can't be pumped up to the brain, to the head to actually oxygenate the brain, then we're going to need a compensatory mechanism. We're going to need that heart rate to increase in order to artificially raise blood pressure levels to push blood upwards. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit here about certain blood pressure and heart rate variables that you may see in people with POTS or orthostatic intolerance. So let's kick off with 120 over 80 with a heart rate of 120 beats per minute. What could this mean? Well, this could be a poor neural reflex response to the upright posture. It could be a heart rate compensation. So for example, if your blood pressure is falling, it could be the heart taking over in order to sustain an adequate blood pressure to allow blood to get up to your head. And it could also be deconditioning. And this is something I spoke about in my previous video. So make sure you go over and watch that video to find out a little bit more about deconditioning and what it really brings with it. And then secondly, we've got 170 over 110 with a heart rate of 150 beats per minute. So this could be one of two things really. This could be a massive heart rate compensation for a huge drop in blood pressure. And so the heart is having to beat really fast to elevate and sustain that blood pressure. But what you may also have is a low parasympathetic tone. And what the parasympathetic nervous system really acts like towards the heart is it's kind of like the brakes when it comes to your heartbeat. So where the sympathetic nervous system is an accelerator of the heart because it releases lots of these stress hormones that speed up the contraction of the heart, the parasympathetic nervous system releases hormones like acetylcholine, which will actually slow down the heart rate. And so we look at this final variable here where we have 80 over 50 in terms of blood pressure and a heart rate of 60 beats per minute while standing. Now, what this is telling me is this isn't really a typical POTS case because your heart rate isn't accelerating above what it should do. And this is the type of presentation you'll probably see in elderly patients whose baroreceptor response isn't adequate enough to raise their blood pressure and heart rate in response to that orthostatic stress. And what we see here is a low sympathetic tone. So it's less vasoconstriction of the blood vessels to get blood up to the head and the heart rate isn't able to actually compensate, so it's a complete withdrawal of the sympathetic nervous system. But back to the case of POTS. Now, systems that act to maintain blood pressure in response to gravity might not be working properly, making it difficult for blood and oxygen to be delivered to the head. Increased heart rate acts as that compensatory mechanism that actually fills in for the decreased blood pressure. So that's where this 120 over 80 with a heart rate of 120 beats per minute will really come into play. And you'll see this presentation, I would say in the majority of cases of people with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And also if somebody has a low blood volume or a low fluid volume, this similar compensatory mechanism from the heart may kick in in order to mobilize fluid and blood more efficiently around the body, the heart may have to speed up. Now, another scenario could be that there is a lack of parasympathetic innovation, meaning that the sympathetic nervous system continuously vasoconstricts blood vessels and increases that production of catecholamines, which in turn increases the heart rate. And you'll typically see this in presentations of people who have a blood pressure of 170 over 110 with a massively elevated heart rate of maybe 150, 160, or maybe even 170 beats per minute. So in order to understand what may be going on with POTS sufferers, I think it's really important to note some of the behaviors that people adopt who end up living with POTS, just some of the signs and symptoms to look out for with people. So for example, things like bending over while standing, leaning against a wall or an object, crossing their legs while standing, maybe tensing their calves, walking around instead of standing still and then certain other behaviors like crossing their legs while being seated opting to lie down instead of being seated tensing their calves or moving their legs around while seated 
They feel most relaxed when lying down. And they can't handle warm conditions like hot weather or being in a shower, especially when being upright. And also they wear compression garments and they crave salty foods. Now, what might all of these behaviors have in common with one another? Well, the one thing that they all do is they all promote vasoconstriction, which is the constriction of blood vessels in attempt to try to push blood upwards towards the head and brain. And now these are things that should be happening unconscious to us. They should be happening automatically in a healthy and fit human being. But somebody who lacks some of these reflexes or has less of a tone of certain reflexes when it comes to pushing blood up towards the head in response to gravity, they'll deploy lots of these artificial ways to try to maneuver blood upwards. And that brings us on to improper blood distribution. So I'm going to read this out to you guys. This is super interesting. So make sure you stay tuned for what I'm about to say. A blood pressure drop upon standing is typically linked to the pooling of blood to the arteries in the lower limbs, as well as a failure of the arteries to constrict upon standing. The physiological changes accompanying POTS can be described as a temporal mismatch between cardiac output and vascular resistance. When humans change position from sitting to standing, it is the job of the vestibular system to detect changes in gravity and signal to the sympathetic system to successfully constrict blood vessels, redistributing blood to the brain and increasing blood pressure. The vestibulosympathetic reflex is the connection between signals from the vestibular system activating the sympathetic nerves which regulate the cardiovascular system. The VSR is essential for preventing a drop in blood pressure and symptoms of orthostatic intolerance because the VSR is activated at the onset of sensing motion. The otoliths detect a position change with respect to gravity within milliseconds, thus play a key role in the activation of the VSR. And if you're wondering what the otoliths are, it's these little stones in our inner ear that detect positional changes in response to gravity so that our body can detect when we're supine, when we're seated, when we're standing. It should be a reaction that occurs very swiftly so that we don't even consciously notice it. But it's these otoliths that are so important in detecting these changes. And if we have less of an input to them, or for some reason they've been damaged to some extent, we're going to start to detect some of these symptoms when it comes to having problems with orthostatic intolerance. So what are some of the factors that could be contributing to POTS? So number one here, I've put the one that I truly believe is the most likely situation, and that's decreased firing into the vestibulosympathetic reflex, the VSR, because this is essential in preventing a drop in blood pressure during positional changes and that's also linked to the inner ear slash otoliths. Also, decreased activation will contribute to low fluid and blood volume, decreased energy metabolism, and decreased cardiac reflexes. And the reason I believe this is the number one cause for POTS is firstly just because it makes the most logical sense when learning about the systems in the human body that are actually there to deal with the change in gravity, the change in position to deal with the forces of gravity and the stress of gravity. But also number two, it's because of the whereabouts of the condition. How did the condition actually arise in the first place? And for lots of people out there, it will be in response to some sort of traumatic brain injury, whether that be a concussion or some sort of bacterial infection of the central nervous system, or maybe adverse reactions to certain medications as well. Secondly is deconditioning of the autonomic nervous system. And this is mainly because exercise produces noradrenaline, which actually tones the muscular blood vessels. So a prolonged period of physical inactivity is actually going to decrease levels of noradrenaline and increase levels of adrenaline, which is going to speed up the heart. So you're going to have less vasoconstriction but a faster heartbeat and more beats per minute, especially when you're standing upright as well. And then the final point here is prolonged elevated cortisol levels. So cortisol is a stress hormone, and they can be elevated in response to stress, free radical oxidative stress, mast cell activation. But one key feature of cortisol is the vasodilation of 
muscular blood vessels and vasoconstriction of splanctic, also known as abdominal blood vessels. And if we think about POTS sufferers for a second, what do they have a lot of going on? Yes, they have a lot of blood pooling and, you know, purple hands and feet because there's excess vasodilation and there's not a capacity to push blood upwards. But also they get lots of gastroparesis slash crampy abdominal pains, which could also be down to this because if we've got excess cortisol, it's going to be vasoconstricting those abdominal blood vessels. So with that all being said, what are some of the best approaches that we can have when it comes to addressing POTS or where to start? Where can we find some information that may be helpful to us and then gradually day to day build on certain activities to help to improve our situation? Well, the first thing I, I think is appropriate is to check for autonomics, your blood pressure and heart rate while supine and also while standing to see if there's that drop in blood pressure and that elevation of heart rate, which there probably will be for most of you with POTS. And check for catecholamines such as cortisol levels throughout the day. You may need to order some sort of test for this just to rule that out as a possible cause. Also, I highly advise you guys to look into functional neurologic rehab or functional neurology itself to activate certain parts of the brain and nervous system to make sure there is sufficient sympathetic and parasympathetic innovation to the heart, blood vessels, and also correct distribution of blood all around the body. I made a series all about functional neurology. I really suggest you guys check it out because I think it really help you. So this could be certain activities such as vestibular therapy. It could be certain eye exercises and eye movements. It could be cerebellar activation. It could be that we have some proprioceptive exercises such as balance and certain movements and coordination and bits and pieces like that. But usually these type of exercises and programs are tailored to each individual based on their findings from a functional neurologic assessment. And also something I highly encourage you guys to check out is a study that was done on the impact of functional neurologic rehab on POTS sufferers. And I'll leave the link to that down below in the description, but make sure you check that out because it's some really fascinating stuff. And then one thing we could do is consider some form of cardiovascular exercise to offset the effects of deconditioning. However, this is most likely going to have to be very gradual and I think that functional neurologic rehab may just be a little bit more important and maybe more important to actually do first before considering building up your cardiovascular tolerance. And then perhaps consider some sort of breathing exercises or breath holding to increase cell oxygenation and help to offset some impacts of over breathing, which is a phenomenon that is quite common amongst people with POTS and other forms of dysautonomia. And then just finally, you may want to consider some sort of therapy or mentoring, somebody who's outside of your family and friends who you just want to discuss your progress to and see if what you're doing is actually benefiting your life and if you're making positive steps in the right direction. So thank you so much for watching this video, guys, and I really hope it offered you some value.